Okay, now let's talk about uh, performance, right? So how is how do we do you know differentiation of a simulator uh, to be able to performantly fit neural networks that are defined inside of a simulation environment, right? Because last time or what we what, where I left you off was this case where you know you saw the best way to be able to fit these neural networks within universal differential equations was to have the entire simulation process be part of the uh, part of the loss function. And that necessitates then being able to do gradient descent or calculate gradients of a simulation. So uh, how do you actually even do this, right? It turns out that there's not one way to do this. There's an entire list of different ways that we call different adjoints or different sensitivity methods. Um, and I'm going to give you a derivation that showcases how they all branch off and you know how one mathematical problem can actually be many different computational problems. So, okay, so, how, uh, so let's do this. Uh, so, you know, um, how do you actually calculate, how do you write down the formula for the derivative of the solution of a differential equation with respect to some parameters? I'm going to give a very quick overview of this derivation. I do a much longer overview in my 18337's uh, Parallel Computing and Scientific Machine Learning course um, that was given at MIT. I have all those videos online, so I'll refer back to those. But uh, this, is, this is kind of a, a succinct uh, uh, way of, of describing this. So. Um, so take, take uh, the di differential equation u prime equals f, right? What we want to do is we want to define a cost function, capital G, over the solution of the differential equation. And the way that we're going to define this, this uh, cost function is, uh, is we're going to say that there's a cost at every time point, right? You know, so for example, you know, there, there's a cost at time t equals 1, there's a time cost at time t equals 2, but there's also a cost at time t equals 1.5, a t cost at time equals 1.47389230, right? There's a cost at every infinitesimal time point. Um, and the total cost of our differential equation against some data set is going to be the integral of all the in, the integral of all the infinitesimal costs, right? So, you know, what is the cost function that we'd have here? Well, you know, we, we want to make sure that that our neural dif differential equation approach matches the l uh, large eddy simulation, and so it's going to be the cost at a given time point is going to be the difference between our prediction and the uh, solution uh, and the you know true solution, right? So we, we have that at every single time point, and we have the integral of that cost at every single time point, which gives us the, the total cost, right? Um, now what we want to do is we want to find out how to calculate the gradient of this total cost with respect to the parameters, right? Because we want to, you know, these parameters define a differential equation. This cost is defined by the solution of the differential equation, and we integrate over that. So, how, so now, the, you know, we want to find out how to take this capital G. We want to take its derivative with respect to P because that's going to be our gradient for the gradient descent uh, direction. So to derive this adjoint, what we do is we introduce a Lagrange multiplier, right? This is now this is going to be a trick, right? Um, so we have take g of p, we subtract off this thing, but this thing is uh, Lagrange multiplier multiplied by u prime minus f. Um, well, u prime equals f because that's the differential equation that we're solving, and so this is just zero, right? So we're just adding zero to our equation. This is going to be a trick, and we'll see what we'll do in a second. Um, so okay, we want to get the derivative of g with respect to p. So let's just do it, right? The the derivative of g with respect to p equals the derivative of i with respect to p, right? Because this is this is zero, um, and so the and the derivative of i with respect to p is well, you take the derivative of this and then you take the derivative of this, right? So you just do chain rule. So chain rule tells us that you have the derivative of g with respect to you know the 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 partial derivative of g with respect to p. And then the partial derivative of g with respect to u, um, and then the partial derivative of u with respect to p, right? That's just a simple chain rule. And so we're going to have the derivative of u with respect to p show up a lot. So let's call this s. This is this is that chain rule written down, right? So g sub p is just the partial derivative of g with respect to p. And now the next term, well, you just do the same. You do uh, you, you you do chain rule on this. So you know here's your Lagrange multiplier, um, and now let's do you know the, the derivative of g of of u with respect to p, right? Prime is derivative of u with respect to p prime, right? Um, now we have f. So what we want to do is we take the partial derivative of of you know derivative of f with respect to u, derivative of u with respect to p, 
So that's F U S um, and derivative of F with respect to P, right? That's just direct, uh, you know, undergrad level chain rule right there. Now we have a difficult expression. So what the heck do we do with this? That's uh, <laughs> it, it didn't really simplify anything yet. So let's 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 try to do something though, right? So we have we have an S prime here. And let's try to get everything with just an S into one equation and uh, see what happens, right? So we want to transform this S prime into something that's S without a prime. So what do you, how do you do that? The trick to, to change derivatives into non-derivative terms inside of, uh, inside of integrals is always integration by parts, right? Um, so, you know, we do integration by parts. Uh, 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 we do integration by parts, you know, choosing S as the thing that's a derivative. And so you... You know, then so if you do that, then you you get it. You know, you flip which term is on the derivative. So you have you know you so we have this term which which equals this term, right? We just uh, distributed to do this, right? Um, and now when we do integration by parts, we just flip what the, what the derivative is, right? So we we flip the derivative, and then we have the evaluation on the boundaries. And this one I haven't touched yet. Um, so okay, so this is just simple integration by parts. Um, and now let's rearrange the expressions, right? So, so you know, that was just how to what to do about this term, how to change s prime into s. So now let's rearrange. You you plug this in here, and now here's what you get, right? So you, this whole term now all just has a multiplied by s. Now this is where the trick comes in, right? So um, remember that that we just had this lambda lambda star the Lagrange multiplier is just completely undefined, right? In fact, we could define it to be anything because it was just some atoms subtract by zero, right? So if we want our equations to be simpler, we can come up with a definition that simplifies our equations because lambda prime could be anything. Let's just choose it to be the best definition where best means we get easy things to calculate. And the easy thing would, would be if this integral was equal to zero, right? I mean, if it was equal to zero, then it'd be cut off. And if for that to be true, what we would need is that lambda star prime plus lambda star fu minus gu would have to be equal to zero, right? So let's define lambda such that lambda star uh, prime equals minus f. You know, this is, this is just, well, this is this equation. Uh, you, you take the adjoint to both sides, right? Um, it's the same exact equation here. So we're just saying if lambda star equals this, then... Uh, then this then the, this term in the integral is equal to zero and therefore this integral is, is zero right so that's our trick for the adjoint so we choose that right um, but we also get to choose its initial condition right and well here's a term that we that is difficult right now let's look at the two boundary terms here right so um, remember that s is the derivative s is the derivative of the solution of the ODE with respect to the parameters at, and, and so, you know, we have two boundaries here. So the derivative of, of the solution with respect to the parameters at time zero, well, you know, it's you, your solu the solution to your ODE is still equal to your initial condition, right? Um, so, I mean, if your initial condition is dependent on parameters, there's a value here, but if your initial condition is considered something that's fixed, like a fixed value, then this term is equal to zero, right? Because this is the derivative of the solution of your ODE at the initial condition. Um, it's just going to be equal to your initial condition. So this, you know, when you if you plug in T zero here, that term is equal to zero. If you plug in the capital T term, well, that's non-zero. But if we choose lambda star of capital T to be equal to zero, then both terms in this equation are zero, right? So let's choose that to be our initial condition uh, for, for this equation, right? And so if lambda satisfies this equation, then this integral is zero, and this term is zero, right? Which means that, uh, well, th then, you know, unless you, unless you have an initial condition term, right, which I mentioned, right? Um, then the only term that's left is this integral. So that's why this is here, right? And this is the adjoint method, right? So let me, let me take a step back and, 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 and showcase what we've just derived. Right. So what we derived is that the way to calculate the derivative of a solution to a differential equation with respect to its parameters is the following. You solve the differential equation, and then you solve this lambda, uh, this lambda defined equation. Right. You know, this thing that we defined. And solve that. And once you have lambda, you can evaluate this integral 
and you can do everything. And so you solve this equation, and ta-da, that gives you the derivative of the cost function with respect to, uh, to parameters. So notice that there's something interesting here, though, right? It's, you know, you solve a differential equation going forwards, and now we chose lambda such that you get, you, you know, you zero the term on the end here, right? We chose this for a reason, but it turns out that you solve an ODE going forwards, and then the derivative calculation comes by solving this thing in reverse, right? So it's almost like continuous time backpropagation through time, right? It's, this is backpropagation of the ODE, this solve right here. It's a special ODE that you solve in reverse that gives you the derivative. Um, I actually will make this even more concrete in a second. So, okay, so this is the adjoint to an ODE, right? That's all it is. Um, well, there's a, there's a few more details, right? So this mathematically holds, but if I was to ask you to implement this into a computer, right, you'd probably start running into issues with, okay, how are these things truly defined? So let, let's look at this equation, right? Uh, it turns out that, you know, if you, if you actually put the of t everywhere in the equations, right, then what you'll see is that you need to take the, the Jacobian of f with respect to u um, at a given time point. So you solve an ODE going forwards, but when you go in reverse, you need to be able to take uh, the, the Jacobian of f with respect to u at the time points that you want for the integration of lambda, lambda right? No, and you know like an ODE integration tends to be adaptive, right? So it takes some steps to calculate u and it takes different steps to calculate lambda, lambda. But on, the, on those steps where it's calculating lambda, it needs to know the value of u to be able to take the, the Jacobian of f with respect to u at that time point, right? So it needs to know u. It basically, what it means is that you need to somehow remember the entire continuous trajectory of u from the forward pass because you need it for this derivative calculation in the back pass. So how do you do it? Well, there's a few different choices that you get to make. One choice is, you know, if you, if you solve, you know, there's this analytical relationship that if you solve u prime equals f going forwards and you solve u prime equals minus f going backwards, then you, you end up on the same trajectory with no numerical error. I'll get to that in a second. Right, so um, so you know what you can do is you can sign you, you can basically solve this equation backwards at the same time as you solve the lambda equation backwards, and that would give you all the values of u that you need. Um, so that's a memory efficient way. The other thing that you can do is you can store the entire u of t going forwards, and you put interpolation on it. And so then anytime you're, when you're solving backwards, you can ask it what is u of t, and you just query that value. But of course, that requires that you store an entire you store an entire differential equation solve uh, going forwards, which could be memory expensive. Um, other thing that you can do is something called checkpointing, right? So you can actually, you can solve an ODE going forwards and then you save a few points. And as you go backwards, you resolve in that area and then you only hold on to the interpolation for that, for that thing. It's kind of a mixture of the two approaches and it's kind of like a less memory intensive way of doing it. And so, you know, you can see that there's this trade-off between memory and compute power performance that comes involved when you're, when you're looking at the different options here. Um, now, the next thing is, right, you know, let's actually look at this equation a little bit more. Um, you know, if there was a mass matrix here, then there would be a mass matrix here, but we can, we can ignore the mass matrix for, for, for this. Um, but what, what this, this Jacobian that you're actually calculating is actually a fairly interesting term. It's the Jacobian uh, of f with respect to u transpose times times the the uh, vector lambda, right? And it turns out that Jacobian vector transpose operations are actually the intrinsic operation of reverse mode automatic differentiation, right? So if you're to do reverse mode automatic, dif if you're to call a reverse mode automatic differentiation engine and you tell it to push forward u and to pull back the vector lambda, it will calculate uh, df du star uh, lambda, right? That's what it does. It calculates the Jacobian transpose times a vector. Um, it turns out that the reason why you do this is because the Jacobian transpose, um, you know, the, the, the rows of a Jacobian are the gradients. And so this is doing a direct calculation of the gradients without having to build the, the, the matrix, the Jacobian. But because this is the, the intrinsic, um, you can directly use a reverse mode automatic differentiation trick to calculate this term without ever computing the Jacobian. Um, if you want more information on this, you 
you'll have to go through the lectures on the 18337 uh, Parallel Computing and Scientific Machine Learning course at MIT, where we go into a lot of detail about how reverse mode automatic differentiation is, is implemented um, and, and the mathematics behind it. That will describe this in a lot more detail. But for now, if, if you don't get that part, just trust me that there's an automatic differentiation trick that lets you compute Jacobian transpose times a vector without building the Jacobian. And so there's many different ways to be able to just implement the adjoint equation, right? So you can do numerical differentiation to build a Jacobian, then you transpose it, then you multiply it by vector. You can do forward mode automatic differentiation to build a Jacobian, transpose it, multiply by a vector. Or you can use reverse mode automatic differentiation and do this trick. And you will take, instead of having to do an O of N operation, you could turn it into an O of one operation. Um, Oh, where where you know the, the the polynomial is the number of columns in in the in the Jacobian here, so this is a fairly nice trick uh, to know if for for this and this is one of these things where some of the some of the uh, software is compatible with doing these tricks and some of these software are not compatible with doing it and this is somewhere a place where you'll see orders of magnitude performance difference. Um, but also, you know, I, I mentioned that when, when we do this, right, you know, this looks a lot like reverse mode automatic differentiation, uh, you know, uh, or backpropagation through time. Well, now you know that, you know, this is solving an ODE forwards, and then it's solving an ODE in reverse, where the ODE that you're solving in reverse is reverse mode automatic differentiation of the forward solve. And, you know, at every single time point. It's defined by you, uh, lambda prime equals call reverse mode AD engine um, at that time point, right? So... I mean, the, the, it's not even just an analogy anymore. This is, you know, the, this is the continuous time version of rack propagation through time. Um, so, okay, and, and so you do want to try to make use of any reverse mode AD tricks that you can then in the equations that show up here. But okay, uh, how do you actually calculate, you know, when, when I say that you calculate this integral, right, well, you know, this requires knowing lambda star of t, and so, um, you know, what do you do to calculate lambda star of t? And um, one thing that you can do is you just store the entirety of lambda star, and then you do, do the integral, right? You use Gaussian quadrature or something. Um, that's memory intensive, though that can be a fast way of doing it. The other thing that you can do is you can, you can use a trick, right? So you can use ODE solvers to solve integrals. Uh, so so uh, one way to solve, do that is, you know, so if you, if you actually write out the Riemann approximation to an integral, Right, you know, so you know you have the integral of, of, of some function f, right? Then you have you know you the, you know the Riemann approximation or the trapezoidal rule is going to be you know one half f one or f of t zero, you know, and then you have uh, f of t one f plus f of t two plus f of t three plus f of t four, etc. Right? If you write this out and then you look at what happens if you run Euler's method on a ODE on an ODE defined by the integrand it turns out that they're the same thing. Um, and so if you solve an ODE with the initial condition equal to zero, and this right-hand side of the ODE is only dependent on the independent variable, right? Notice that this, uh, this ODE does not have mu on the right-hand side, right? That's what I mean. So if your ODE is actually not dependent on the dependent variable, um, then, and your initial condition is equal to zero, then solving that ODE is equivalent to solving the, an integral. And so I, you know, go, go work that out on, on your own time. It's fairly easy, quick to prove. But this gives you another trick, right? You can solve this ODE. Um, you solve this ODE in reverse, and therefore you get this integral without having the solution to this integral without having to explicitly calculate an integral. Um, so, uh, you know, so I gave you basically three different ways to do three different steps. And so, you know, you can come up with a combinatorics. There's like 27 ways to then implement this adjoint equation. And so which ones are good, right, is a, is a, is a question that you need to always ask when you do a numerical analysis, right? Um, just because you have a method doesn't necessarily mean it's a good method. And, and so and every combination here is a mathematically valid way to calculate things. But the issue is that a lot of these are not numerically valid ways of doing it. So um, to pick on somebody, uh, let's take a look at the, the method that was come up in the Neural Ordinary Differential Equations paper. Right there, they're for doing, you know, uh, putting neural networks inside of, of ordinary differential equations to do things like image classification and, you know, MNIST, right? Very different application, but it's still the same idea that they needed to take derivatives of an ODE solution with respect to parameters. 
And to do that, what they did was they said, well, we, we solved this ODE in reverse. And what, what, you know, how do you, how do you understand that? Well, this is, if you, if you go to this, right, it says you solve this equation and you have to solve this equation in reverse, but you need to know what, what U is when you go backwards. And so you can append this ODE to what you solve backwards. And you can append this ODE to what you solve backwards to get the integral out. And so if you have, if you solve all three of those ODEs simultaneously, you get the, you get the derivative of the solution with respect to parameters, right? Um, and so that sounds great because you don't need to store anything in memory. It's, well, it's O of one in memory. So, you know, it sounds like it's a good idea, but if we dig into it, we can actually find a lot of flaws with it. So here, for example, um, is an example where you either have the, the ODE that you solve with your method, either that will, will di uh, diverge to infinity or the gradient calculation will diverge to infinity. So it's exponentially, you know, unconditional, un unstable method. Um, so how, how do you come up with the, this, this counterexample? So it actually comes from one of the simplest partial differential equations, the advection equation, right? So the advection equation is du dt equal, uh, plus uh, d, you know, a du dx equals zero. And it's just a wave moving with constant velocity in one direction, right? And if you've ever seen this before in your you know, undergrad physics classes or something, um, then you will know that when you discretize this equation, right, you have to, you know, you can keep the, the du dt intact, right, and so that way you get an ODE, but you have to choose a direction to differentiate, to, to discretize the operator for du dx. Um, and so you either do, you know, you either do forward minus reverse divided by delta x, or you do, uh, you know, forward minus middle divided by delta x, or you do middle to minus uh, back divided by delta x, right? Either, either of these differences is going to give you the uh, you know, approximation to du dx at this time point, right? So you have to choose one, but you can't just choose it arbitrarily, right? And, and if, you choose the wrong, if you choose the wrong choice for this discretization, you actually get unconditional instability. And you, know, the, you use a von Neumann proof in your undergrad course to prove this, but I think that there's a much more intuitive way to understand it. If a wave is moving from the left to the right, then if you have a method that is u prime, u prime equals uh, right minus middle, right, then you know your update for value x right here tells you to update using the value here and the value here. But the value, but you know, I mean, since it's just a wave moving to the right, the true solution, the analytical solution, is that the value here should be equal to the value here. But that doesn't that value on the left does not show up in your equation at all, right? So how are you supposed to ever get this this uh, you know solve this correctly if the value that you need to solve in there is not even show up in your equation? It's not even like it's numerically approximately in there. There is nothing to your left that is in your update equation if you use this version. And so therefore, how do you make it so that way you move a wave to, from the left to the right? That's just physically impossible, mathematically impossible. Right? You have no information from the left, and so your solution is not, cannot do this equation properly. Which is why, you know, if you, so if you choose to do this minus this divided by delta x, when, uh, when a is, equal, is, uh, is less than zero, then the wave moves to the right, and this, this discretization of your differential equation gives you an unconditionally unstable discretization. Uh, you have unconditional error, and it grows exponentially in every step. If you use the other direction, you know, if you use uh, ui minus ui minus 1 divided by delta x, then you have this point and this point, and the way that you update uh, is, you know, you use the difference between the two, and it tells you how to move it, and because a is positive, you're going to be moving the wave forward, and so this is a stable discretization of the partial, di partial differential equation. So, okay, so why did I go through this example? Well, because, you know, now what happens if you do this, right? You solve an ODE forwards and you solve an ODE in reverse to be able to get the derivative. Well, if you solve this forwards and the wave moves to the right, you solve this in reverse, the wave moves to the left. And so if you just did, you know, u prime equals f, and then you did u prime equals minus f to be able to flip it, well, you just flip the direction of this wave. And so if you use the same uh, differential equation, then you get an unconditional instability. 
right? So you either have to have an unconditional instability in your forward solve, or you have an unconditional instability in your reverse solve. And so this is an equation where this is a mathematically correct way, right? You know, there's nothing mathematically wrong about this way to calculate the derivative of an ODE solution with respect to parameters. It is a mathematically correct way, but is a numerically in, uh, unstable way of doing it. And this is an example that exploits that to its best where it's just completely 100% unstable for all parameters. Uh, for all parameters, for all choices of delta x, and for all choices of delta t. Um, it's just a purely unstable method. Um, so yeah, that can happen. Like you, you need to really be aware of the numerical analyses and the numerical problems with this. Um, and so we actually have a paper on, uh, on stiff nor ordinary differential equations, which goes into details about how do you handle the numerical issues in here. Um, I do want to highlight that there's some other numerical issues that arise when you're trying to differentiate simulators. So here is one that, that is uh, very interesting. Uh, um, so, you know, uh, especially for groups that work a lot on chaotic systems like on, and, and body systems. So um, if you try to take the derivative of long-term behavior of an n-body system, um, you know, of a chaotic system, your derivative will actually diverge to infinity. Um, automatic differentiation will give you the wrong answer. This is something that's relatively easy to show because, autom because uh, th there's a relationship between automatic differentiation and the Lyapunov coefficient. The Lyapunov coefficient is the rate at which the tangent space grows. It's the exponential rate of the tangent space growth. And the way that you calculate automatic, do forward mode and reverse mode automatic differentiation is that you, you basically put values into your tangent space and you let them evolve through your system. And so if that is evolving exponentially, it should be no surprise that it's gonna be divergent to infinity and you get an infinite amount of error. Another way to understand what happens is that when you're solving a chaotic system, you do not necessarily get a correct answer, right? You, you know, so here, for example, with solving the Lorentz equations with float 64 and float 62, at the lowest tolerance that they can in the two of them. And you see that over time you get O of one error, right? You know, exponential growth in errors means that sooner or later chaotic system will have O of one error from it, from the numerical solution, the true solution. The only reason why we could even say that this is a representation of the solution to the Lorentz equations at all is because of a fun fact called the, the shadowing lemma. So the shadowing lemma tells us that, you know, any time that you numerically solve a, a ODE that is chaotic, you do not get the right trajectory, right? The trajectory that you're looking at is completely O of one error wrong after a given time frame, right? And, you know, after Lyapunov time. But what you do have as a, is what you do get is you get a solution that lives on the attractor. And it's kind of odd that that's true, but you know, another way of saying it is actually that um, there is a epsilon perturbation in your parameters that is the true solution that you actually numerically simulated. So you do get something that's a solution to the chaotic equations, you just get the wrong one. Um, and because of exponential error growth, you can never know what if you have the right one. So you know, when you do automatic differentiation, then normally you differentiate with respect to the path that you're on. And so you know, that's another way to understand that forward mode automatic differentiation, reverse mode automatic differentiation, those are doomed if you ever try to do that on a chaotic simulation. Um, there are different methods that you can make use of. We wrote a blog post about all this and, and how it's done. Uh, so you can take the derivative of ergodic quantities, um, so like average values of, of chaotic attractors and stuff. You can do that using what we call shadowing methods, and we can go into detail on how that's actually done. Um, but you know, it means that you need to, if you end up in these chaotic situations, this is another case where you need to be very careful about your numerical error and not just simply trust what comes out of automatic differentiation. This is not an implementation thing with automatic differentiation. This is like fundamental in the numerical analysis. Um, so okay, so so let's 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 bring this back a bit, right? So you know I, these are two numerical issues that can show up in um, in choosing adjoints. So this this really informs us that you know that you can't just do an arbitrary choice for how you do this derivative calculation. You need to think about it a little bit. And so you know let's let's look at this. So um, you know. So, so let's go back through our choices, right? So we had steps one, two, three, and in each of these three steps, we had you know one, two, three ways of doing step one. We had one, two, you know, we had six ways of doing that. We had two, two ways of doing that, right? So let's actually go through our choices and see see the tr the trade offs that happen, right? 
Um, so if you do the forward solve, then you reverse it like this, you have less memory, but it's unstable, as I mentioned. If you keep the whole entire U of T going forwards, it's stable, but you have to keep an entire continuous ODE solution, which is high memory. Checkpointing, you solve once, and then you save a few points, and you resolve small intervals. This decreases the memory, but it also increases the amount of compute because you have to resolve intervals, right? So, um, and so you have to make a trade-off here between do you want a method that is uh, exponentially unstable with respect to the Lyapunov coefficient? Do you want one that is high in memory? Do you want one that does has to do a bit more of, uh, of compute? Um, you have to make a choice there. And so, um, oh, there's, a, there's another thing that happens, which is that, okay, so if you solve, you know, if you just take your, you know, if you take this ODE and you append it to your original set of equations, now your set of ODE is larger. And stiff ODE solvers do not scale and cost linearly with the number of ODEs. They scale cubically with the number of ODEs because of the LU factorization. And so if you're doing a stiff ODE solve and you do make this choice to just append more values onto there, you go from states plus parameters, right? You, you go for, uh, and then do an integral. Um, you go from this to, well, if I have a stiff ODE solve, then the total number of ODEs that you solve is the number of states and the number of parameters you have, and you cube it, which means that, you know, this is a, this, this way of calculating the, um, th this, this way of calculating, you know, using, using this appending idea, you know, this idea that's also used in here and also in sundials and such, um, the cost that is associated with that is actually cubic in the number of weights of the uh, of the uh, neural ODE or of the neural network, um, which is actually as bad as um, ca having to calculate the Hessian, right? So when you do when you do like Newton's method um, uh, on for you know when you do Newton's method, you have to calculate the Hessian and you have to factorize it, and that factorization step is O of n cubed with respect to the size of the Hessian. Um, you know, and that cubic behavior is why people don't take Hessians of neural networks and why they don't do second order derivative method or second order optimization methods. And now here, what this is showing you is that if you do this method naively for, uh, for calculating the derivative of an ODE solution, you cut down on the amount of memory. But if you're doing this in the context of a stiff ODE, even though you're doing a first order optimization just asking for the gradient, you have to calculate something that is as expensive as the Hessian. So this is a method that doesn't scale. Um, in terms of compute cost at all. And you know you can use a method that, that uses more memory or you can do all sorts of different tricks. And we describe these tricks in, in the paper. And so you know so this is there's this is showing you that you know you can write down so many different ways to do, you know mathematically, there's only one way to calculate this, but in reality, there's you know orders of magnitude difference that you get from the different ways of doing it. Um, so yeah, so this is where we recognize that scientific machine learning, one of the biggest issues in it right now is that it's a software problem, right? Um, you know, there's a lot of things for standard machine learning where you know what software to go to. There's a lot of things in, in you know, standard scientific computing where, you know, you, you, do, you pull up ODE15S and you know that it's going to work. Uh, scientific machine learning, in order to make all these methods robust and, and simple and fast, it's going to take years and years of building out a full software stack that does this appropriately. Um, now, what we what we have been, and this is essentially what we've been doing then, and so we've been able to show, for example, about um, 100x faster than like MATLAB Python R for, for doing standard differential equation solves. Um, we can outperform C and Fortran based uh, ODE solvers with the, the ones built into ordinary diff EQ. And then we can pair all of them with a whole bunch of different adjoints. Where when I say that these, the, you know, what are these adjoints? They're different choices in that choice matrix, right? Of choosing, for example, this one uses the memory intensive method for the integral. This one uses the memory intensive method for calculating the Jacobian terms while doing the reversing. Um, and so it takes a lot of memory, but it takes less uh, compute, right? And so there's, you, you can take any of the differential equation solvers and switch between these adjoints. You now know what they all are in some sense. Um, and how much of a performance difference does this actually make? Well, here we took a stiff partial differential equation as our model, um, and we, uh, we changed the number of parameters by, by changing the, the discretization size, the, the d, dx. And what we showed was changing, you know, these different methods uh, have about four orders of magnitude difference in the, in the compute cost it takes uh, for actually calculating the derivative of the solution with respect to parameters. And so for, you know, 
with the, the methods that are unique to the Julia tools are these ones which are here compared to, you know, ones that are you know, a few orders of magnitude higher. And so this tells you that it's not just like a, it's not just a little detail, right? You know, it's not like you can just choose any of these here and get to the something simple, similar, right? They are a very fundamental and very large trade-off in compute and memory performance. Um, and so, right, and so the reason why we showcase a lot of the Julia tools for this is precisely because the tools from C++, right, you know, Sundials and Pet C, they don't, uh, they don't necessarily let you use the AD integration or they don't have the, the automatic AD integration into the adjoint rule, which remember is that, uh, is that case that you need to do here to send it from O of one, N to O of one for the Jacobian vector, for co the Jacobian vector product while the other cases don't have the, the stable adjoints which are required for the, for the more difficult uh, numerical cases. Um, so yeah. So, so, uh, how do, uh, how, so I guess one question that you then ask is, uh, what, what, how do you compare between the methods for scientific machine learning then, right? What, um, what you know, I showed you pins and I showed you un universal differential equations. Pins take, you know, 15 minutes to explain uh, you know, differentiable simulation takes all the rest of the time. Uh, why would you ever do the second one? And, you know, I remember that I mentioned that performance is one of the issues with pins. Um, so if you want to do, a, let's say you want to do this inverse problem on the Lorenz equation, right? This is actually pulled directly from the tutorial that comes with this physics informed neural network library, DFXDE, from the developers of the method. Um, you know, we, we pull their example and, it, and a pin will take 362 seconds to solve, you know, to learn the parameters of this Lorentz equation on t and 0 of 3, right? Now we do differentiable simulation, right? We, we take our simulator, you solve it, you check the loss against data, you, you do gradient descent on that, and you see that it solves in 0 0.03 seconds, right? Like, this is a 10,000x difference. You can go example to example and example, keep on showing this. Um, pins are slow. Pins are not just slow, pins are really slow. You can go go look on Twitter, a lot of people who you know, are getting mad about how slow pins are. Um, yeah, so differentiable simulation techniques, they make use of a lot of extra tools from numerical analysis and such, and it shows off in the end. It shows off in performance. Uh, now, you could even go to some of the papers, right? So there are some papers out there that will, stem, that will say, hey, you know, some of these neural network solvers uh, take a fraction of the compute cost needed by classical numerical solvers to do the solve, right? Um, and so you, you can take a look at their graph, right? So here's, you know, the deep O net in comparison to a num classical numerical solver. Turns out that this example is, uh, that they use for this, for this case is one of the tutorials for the Julia simulation library. So what if you don't just use, you know, standard SciPy, but you use a true differentiable simulator um, that can do this, you know, learning of differential equations and stuff. Um, it turns out that if you know if you copy paste the, the the code from the from the tutorial, you'll see that it solves all thousand trajectories that they asked for in 0 0.06 seconds, which is all the way down here, not even on the chart, right? So um, so you know basically what this shows is that you know a deep O net trained with you know Tesla V100 CPUs is about seven thousand times slower than using a, you know, just a standard differential equation solver, which kind of reverses this, this, this point. Um, and you, know, you might have seen similar things said about Fourier neural operators where they had a paper come out and MC Hammer tweeted about it. They said, so much faster than numerical solvers. And people today still aren't using it because numerical solvers are tens of thousands of times faster. Um, and so I think that the last thing that I want to do uh, to talk about is you know, how, how come you have some people showcase a result like this, um, even though an optimized solver ends up like, you know, beating it by a lot. So I think you might have gotten one piece of it, right? One piece of it is that doing the wrong thing with a classical numerical solver will, will change your results by a uh, thousand, ten thousand times. And so your performance, your runtime, right, is heavily dependent on how good you implement a classical method. Um, you know, the classical numerical solvers with adjoint methods and such are very, very, very implementation dependent. Um, and so is this, do you think that this difference that people are doing and seeing, you know, for pins outperforming some classical method, could it be because of just bad classical implementations matching up against a good ma ma machine learning implementation? 
Uh, yes, that, that is the case. But why would people be using a good machine learning implementation against a, a bad classical implementation? I think this is something that people haven't really dug too much into, but it's actually really easy to explain. Um, I actually got in contact with the author of this paper, and, and their response is actually what, uh, what made me look into this. Um, so so um, if you look at what happens when, when you look at these uh, you know, simulation codes that are written in like C, Fortran, you know, classically, and they have all these sparse matrix operations, and, and you, know, so you use a bunch of sparse matrix operations, you're writing out ODEs and nonlinear equations, these kinds of codes are dominated by O of 1 and O of N operations. What I mean by that is they're dominated by matrix vector products, and they're dominated by, vector, uh, by loops over vectors, right? You know, like broadcast operations, map operations. Um, for these kinds of operations, handling mutation and memory management uh, appropriately can change your performance by an order of magnitude. Doing manual SIMD operations and such will do half an order of magnitude. There's so many different things that matter for these kinds of codes that are doing O of N and O of N cubed operations. But when you go to machine learning, every single step of, of applying another layer in machine learning is just a matrix multiplication. Matrix multiplication is O of N cubed. And if you actually look at the performance blocks, right, you look at what matters for performance, um, when you have matrix multiplications and you have more than a hundred values, right, then the best thing the best thing to do for you th for optimizing that code is to do pretty much absolutely nothing, and you just call a fast matrix multiplication kernel, something called BLOS, or you just uh, call a matrix multiplication kernel on a GPU, right? When people say that GPUs make things faster, it's because there's enough compute that needs to be done on a small amount of data for certain, oper uh, for certain applications because they're doing O of N cubed operations, right? So uh, operations that have to see every data point, you know, N, N squared times, right? Um, and that's just not true for a lot of operations. Like a lot of operations are not in this O of N cubed range. And if you look at the, the, the performance of like, you know, so here this is a performance of matrix vector products, ma matrix, or this is, a uh, you know, this is mapping operations, BLOS1 operations. This is vector matrix vector products. This is matrix matrix multiplication, right? If you look at which things are fast enough in these different scenarios, you'll see that GPUs are almost never, or, you know, it, it takes very, very large, it takes very large vectors for GPUs to ever be faster for matrix vector and matrix matrix operations if they are faster, right? It can be depending on the implementation actually for these cases. And Handling memory appropriately causes major differences, but when you go over to uh, when you go over to BLOS three operations, matrix matrix operations, and you say I have large layers, so I'm doing big you know big scale machine learning. The moment your, your layer size is more than 100, the best thing to do is you just do um, matrix matrix operations. This this line right here and the line right above it, that's the difference between being doing the optimal version of the GPU code and the suboptimal version. Optimizing your code doesn't matter here. Um, this is the optimized, this is the unoptimized, this is the optimized, this is the unoptimized. Optimizing your code matters a lot here. And so that is one of these things that you're seeing as a major difference. That if you stay in the machine learning realm with you know, large scale matrix opt optimizations or large scale matrix operations, then code optimization doesn't matter very much. This is actually why PyTorch has been able to do okay, right? Py Python is a slow language. PyTorch has a large overhead. It actually adds an overhead of about one millisecond for every operation. But if you do enough big operations, like you know, matrix multiplications with big layer sizes, then PyTorch doesn't need to worry about its overhead. It just needs to worry about how fast it can do those big kernel calls and it spent all this time optimizing that. And its performance looks okay for machine learning. If you apply it to a lot of other domains, though, you can go back and see, you know, the you know what happens when you implement an ODE solver in PyTorch. You see that it's that you know nine thousand, you know, nine, four thousand nine hundred times slower than the differential than the Julia-based one, right? This is the the reason for this is because of opt uh, because on smaller kernels, um, you know, it, PyTorch has a high overhead, and so it takes very large kernels before uh, it takes very large sets of ODEs before you can overcome that overhead cost.
But if you just do standard machine learning and you're just doing big matrix multiplications everywhere, that's overcome and therefore your performance is okay. And therefore, if you are doing physics informed neural networks and deep O nets, um, and you just do the write the simplest code, you'll get pretty close to optimize. I'd say that you know uh, the simplest code is usually only about three x from optimize. There's there's some other things that you could do that I don't show here, but I mean you know it's not that far off. And so you know what when I ask a lot of these authors like you know how come pins kind of can do well in some you know papers, but you do, they don't seem to do so well in practice. What ends up what ends up always being the case is they optimize that both codes the same amount which means they optimize both codes about none. And if you optimize both codes about none, then the code that is doing you know, closer to standard machine learning, right? bigger neural networks, physics informed neural networks, right? that will be more optimized than the classical method, which is needs to do more things with memory handling. That's why you get this result. And that's why it completely reverses when you actually use some kind of optimized classical numerical code. Um, you can even see this in another way. We wrote a blog post about something called simplechains.jl, which uh, was f uh, five times faster on the CPU than PyTorch on GPU for uh, for OD for um, ma uh, matrix for neural networks whose layers are sized less than 100 or below, um, and is about 10 times faster than JAX. Why was it able to do that? Well, because in this range where you're where your 100 matrices are lower, then you can hyper specialize the CPU operations to greatly outperform the GPU operations. Um, PyTorch has a high enough overhead that it's actually faster on GPU than CPU on this in this range, and which is why we chose it there. But Jax gets rid of some of that overhead, but is still not able to match the CPU performance because they get rid of some of the overhead, but they don't make use of this memory management mutation part. Um, and so there's about a 10x difference there. What this tells you is that, you know, if you're not doing big matrices, right? So if you have matrices of 100 or less, then you have to really care about the code that you're writing. And so, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, general computations are generally less optimized. Physics and form neural networks are the most general type way of doing uh, machine learning, uh, scientific machine learning, right? They applied it literally any partial differential equation, integral differential equation, et cetera. But that means that you have a trade-off for speed. Um, differentiable simulation methods are very good, right? You know, things like universal differential equations. But this derivation that I gave you, right, this derivation right here, this, this whole few set of slides right here, this is only about ODEs. So the moment you say, oh, I want to do this PDE or this, you know, this, I want to do uh, this differential algebraic equation or something, you have to extend this derivation. And so, um, so the downside to the differentiable simulation approaches is, is that you need to create good differentials. You need to create a good differentiable simulator for every single case that shows up, but that differentiable simulator will almost certainly outperform uh, physics and form neural network kinds of approaches by orders of magnitude if, if you put the time and work in to do that. So, um, you know, it, so this is where I say if you if you want to use optimized implementations of scientific machine learning software, this is what we do a lot with the with the SciML group. We, you know, we show that we can outperform the C and Fortran methods with the differential equation solvers. We have adjoints that outperform the you know, the sundials and PET C. We showcase outperforming Simulink, et cetera, et cetera. We're kind of going case by case by case to be able to build as fast implementations of everything. Right. Not just of the differential equation and, different, and differential simulation approaches, but also fast implementations of physics and form neural networks, deep O nets, and all these other things. So that way we can really have a true good baseline and understand the real performance differences between all these scientific machine learning methods. Um, this is all done out in the open. So if anyone is interested in, in uh, digging more into all these performance details and, uh, and joining with the work that we do, you know, just get in touch and we can, we can talk. Um, but yeah, so, you know, this stuff is, I want to end by mentioning that, you know, this stuff is already being used and seen in, in real world cases. So, you know, NASA's launch services program switched over from Simulink to the SciML 10 based tooling and got a 15,000 times acceleration. Pfizer's been using it for um, a lot of their quantitative systems pharmacology. Moderna famously used it uh, for accelerating the vaccine trials. And so, you know, scientific machine learning and these techniques, they're, they're here to stay at this point. Um, so yeah, so you'll, you'll be having to do a lab for this. I think that for the lab, it's just going to be a very simple case of run a simulator and be able to train a neural network inside the simulator. So you have to work through some of the things about how do you, you know, how do you do deal with the automatic differentiation and such and, and, you know, get to explore that a little bit. 
But hopefully this gives you a nice overview of what scientific machine learning is, how it's used, and uh, some, of the, some of the mathematical problems and interesting you know, numerical analysis things that come up when uh, in this field. Um, you know, this is a very, very brief overview of the mathematical problems, but hopefully you know, that at least uh, sparks your interest, or at least it shows you, you know, what are the kinds of things that people are thinking about for improving scientific machine learning, and how does that relate to machine learning, right? You know, people just do straight automatic differentiation in machine learning. Well, this is how, you know, scientific machine learning is taking the automatic differentiation, but taking differential equation ideas and really merging the two together. So, yeah, thank you very much.